We're going to be talking about how to support substance use disorder treatment, uh, both for psychiatry and also for primary care. And to discuss this, I am really glad that we have Catherine Katz Wessel with us today. And she's the executive officer at the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. She has over 30 years of background and experience in the substance use disorder field and administration, medical education, and policy. Um, prior to working with the uh, American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, she was the Associate Director of Brown University's Center for Alcohol and Addiction Studies for over 19 years and the Executive Director of Physicians and Lawyers for National Drug Policy. So, uh, Catherine, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And, um, you know, just to get us started, uh, if you can share with us, I mean, AAAP uh, has supported greatly uh, psychiatry and primary care to address substance use disorders. Um, can you just share with us AAAP's uh, mission and, you know, what the vision is for the future? What, what, are, their, sure. what are their goals? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. The American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry is a subspecialty of psychiatry. The large majority of my members are board certified through the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology uh, as addiction specialists. Um, and that's been in existence for almost 30 years now. So they really are the dream team because they have not only the psychiatry um, credentials and background, but they also have the expertise to deal with the co-occurring uh, substance use disorders uh, in uh, comorbidly or co-occurrently with the um, psychiatric disorders, which is really uh, critical to do since we know the large majority of people have both a substance use disorder and a co-occurring mental disorder. Um, our overall mission, um, first and foremost, are clinicians. Uh, but secondly, a large majority of them are affiliated in universities and they do research, they teach, they publish. Uh, and so um, really making sure that their evidence-based practices and the prevention, treatment, and recovery of all substance use disorders and other addictive disorders, um, not just substances. So um, education is really key and center to everything that we do. We have a peer-reviewed journal. We have courses online to help, um, you know, first and foremost is trying to get more psychiatrists to be trained in addiction. So we had to take care of our own kitchen or house first. Uh, which is a real challenge. Um, uh, as you know, uh, the substance use disorder or addictions fields is highly stigmatized, not only in the general public, but even within medicine. A lot of physicians and other health professionals will say, oh, I don't, I don't take care of those patients. They're those patients. Um, and so uh, unfortunately, it's a kind of an uphill battle. But my uh, members are really committed, very compassionate and passionate about taking care of people that are really highly stigmatized. So training and education is probably at the forefront of, of what we really are about. I see. Yeah. So it's uh, empowering clinicians, uh, physicians to really address these needs through education. That's the primary thing. Um, and do you provide that uh, credential yourself, that specialization or, or how to where, where does the uh, training come from? No, to be board certified in addictions, there's a fellowship. You have to do a fellowship through uh, the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. So it's like any other board certification. It goes to the Medical Board of Medical Specialties. So um, to be board certified. But there's a tremendous amount you can do without being board certified. You don't have to be a, a specialist for a lot of the parts of dealing with it. Um, again, a lot of my members are really involved uh, in the teaching and the training and the research, but also serious mental illness. But in general, you know, there's a tremendous amount of a need for all health professionals to be able to screen, to diagnose, and if not treat, to refer to someone. So I think uh, the large majority of what we're hoping to do with, with primary care is really target that low hanging fruit. There's so many people that we can integrate into our general wellness taking uh, to address things early before they become a real severe problem. And that's the large majority of people. They use you know, um, alcohol, you know, unhealthy levels. Um, they use prescription drugs or other medications off label, things like that. If we can get the rest of the healthcare system 
uh, being better on the front end of things, we could be less likely to get to the further end. So I think that um, that's a real key of what we hope to do is partner with primary care to really identify these um, system uh, issues and also avoid them when we know people are at risk based on you know genetic predisposition and so forth. So if a physician's you know considering getting training, uh, am I hearing this right that there's maybe three levels of training? You have training on screening, diagnosis, referral. Uh, you have training where, where physicians can screen and diagnose and treat. And then you have those that uh, will get the board certification. Is, is, how, well, how, would you, how would you describe that? So a physician thinking about getting training in substance use disorders can position themselves like, where do I fit? What kind of training should I seek out? Yeah, a good question. A great place to start, honestly. I mean, again, you don't have to, unfortunately, this isn't treated, uh, t- taught in medical school or nursing school or PA school. It's now starting to change. We've seen a paradigm shift where more and more health professionals are seeing it as a, re- you know, a regular um, uh, aspect of your, well, your wellness taking. Do you smoke? Do you, you know, do you drink? Do you exercise? You know, um, asking a little bit more to ask general questions to get an idea. So you don't have to be uh, an expert in any way. The one place that I would say to start is we have a grant that's funded by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, and it provides free training. And I would start there. It's called Providers Clinical Support System. P is in Paul, C is in Charlie, S is in Sam, S is in Sam, N-O-W, now.org. We have over 800 online courses. We have mentoring, we have discussion forums, we have everything you could possibly want for all health professionals. We partner with 23 uh, national professional organizations, including, including the American Medical Association, the American Dental, uh, the American um, College of Emergency Physicians, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, we have nurses, we have pharmacists, we have you know, social workers. We have, it's just a, a large coalition of health professionals really focusing on how we can help clinicians feel more comfortable with dealing with patients that have a substance use disorder or may, might be at risk or how to prevent it altogether. So we have SUD 101. We have a core curriculum on pain and addiction, how to do safe opioid prescribing or treating pain without opioids. So it's really meant to be that support system to fill in the gaps we're training early on in your general um, medical training missed. And so I would go there first. And you can even ask for a mentor. Say you were a nurse and you wanted a nurse to help you figure out where do I even start? We can match you up with a nurse, a pharmacist, a dentist, uh, somebody in your area. You're, You're not interested so much discipline specific. I live in Idaho. Where do I find somebody who might be able to help me walk me through this? So we have people all over the country that can help and support at no cost. I think that's really critical is to have the opportunity to find someone that can help walk you through what's needed best for you as an individual. Everybody comes at this at various places. They're pre-contemplative of wanting to care for these patients or they're um, contemplative of, okay, I know I should, but I don't know how to go about it. So the best thing I think is, is to go online to the website, go be a part of a discussion forum where you can post a question and addiction specialist can respond, or you can ask for a mentor. And that mentor can help you personally figure out what you need and how to get started and and the kind of the challenges that you are, you know, working against. But we have very um, foundational elementary level courses for anyone to take. So I would really start there. Wow. That, that's, that's awesome that you do the mentorship because I could see that being extremely useful. Um, so are, are clinicians utilizing that uh, resource, the mentorship, mentorship uh, program? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, during COVID, we saw, um, we have something called clinical round tables and it was meant to be, have a clinician present a case or a situation and then have people, it's like a grant or grand rounds and people can just call in. And we used to limit it to 10 people. Uh, We wanted to keep it personal. We wanted to keep it so people could just discuss. But what we found out during COVID is clinicians are really burned out. They were depressed. They were anxious. They were struggling with their own, having the kids at home and working and balancing it. So we started having them almost daily during um, the week. 
Um, and then sometimes we'd have an open mic where clinicians don't even have to have a clinical situation. They just want to talk. And so the next thing we heard is that we uh, would have 200, 300 clinicians on at one time. And they, then they asked, can we have the cameras on? Because they wanted to connect and see the people. So we did that. And so people can join with a camera. Sometimes people want to just listen. So we try to make it as geared towards the clinician's needs as best possible. So we have them West Coast time, sometimes East Coast. We really try to mix it up to be as, um, as easy as possible for them to take advantage of it. That is fantastic. And you were having them daily. Yeah, yeah, we've cut back now. We have a couple a week, but we are having, we used to have them once a month. And then since COVID, we've had several uh, wow. and we continue to have them. Yeah. Wow. And one obstacle that you face is that uh, clinicians sometimes say, well, you know, I don't work, want to work with that population. I don't want to work with that. Um, so therefore I'm just like, I don't see a need to get training that that's one of the obstacles. Yeah. I think a lot of the stigma, I mean, they, we hear often, not only them, the prescriber, but their staff, they don't want those patients. I've heard them say those patients, or can we put them in a different waiting room? Um, I think a lot of people have a, um, misconception about who, who the people are that struggle with a substance use disorder. They think of what they see on TV and the news. Yes, there are people that are homeless and that, you know, um, you see with a needle shoved up their arm in a trash can area. You know, that's what a lot of people think everybody is that has a substance use or an addiction problem when in fact, they already have those patients in their, in their clinic. They just don't realize it. And they probably, um, at times are probably missing things that are going on with their bodies without knowing about the other things that are happening. So it's a disservice to them as a clinician and to the patient not to have all the data and not to understand and know what's really going on and making it receptive from the front desk all the way to the back, everybody to believe and understand these people are worthy of treatment and they have a medical disorder and they should be treated with dignity. And I think that's a big part that we are trying to overcome is that let them get in the door and, you know, welcome them like you would with any other disorder. Yeah. I mean, whether, whether you want to work with it or not, right. Your patients are going to be struggling with this right. uh, and we don't have to be experts in everything. Right. Uh, but we should know how to screen, right? Assess and refer, right? And support and realize the interconnectedness of these uh, different struggles that uh, patients have and disorders and how they interact with one another and so forth. Yeah, it's so, so vital. Um, so, you know, you mentioned uh, there was a greater need. A lot, lot more people were seeking assistance. Physicians were seeking assistance during COVID-19 what were their struggles during COVID-19 and how did AAAP help fulfill those you know, needs that they were having? Sure. I think the biggest challenge was there's so much um, unknown. The depression, a lot of people dying. They had a lot. I mean, already we were dealing it not just for physicians, for all health professionals and not just for prescribers, the nurse practitioners, the PAs and the physicians, of course, you know, are central, but everybody else on the full team is needed. Um, and so getting everyone to understand, but then also it's a heavy burden. Even with the opioid crisis, our, our, our members were really overloaded. There are not enough people that have the training and the expertise and the know-how to take care of these patients. And then you add COVID on top of it, where there's a lot of isolation, difficulty getting to if some, you know, go to AA meetings or support systems or interacting with people. Sometimes being in an enclosed environment in a dysfunctional family can increase the stressors. Uh, getting access to your medications. So it's a lot of challenges. And you know, uh, to begin with a lot of my members were really hesitant about using telepsychiatry. Um, and that was something we've been pushing for a long time um, since there is such a small number of psychiatrists to start with, but those with um, credentials in addiction and psychiatry was really even harder. And now um, that was a good thing that came out of this. It pushed them out of their comfort zone to seek uh, ways of really providing care um, in an area they hadn't really done, you know, they would say to me, I'm, I wasn't taught to do things over line. I'm supposed to smell the person's breath. I'm supposed to see their eyes. I'm supposed to get a sense of their body language. And so they were very hesitant, but I think that was the thing that really pushed them. And now they're like doing it and think it's great. And they're seeing a lot of benefits from it. So I think while there are a lot of negative things came out of it, there were some very positive things that made um, it easier for patients to get in, to be seen and that type of thing for a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot. And 
does AAAP do any uh, work on policy changes to support telehealth more in terms of reimbursement? That was a reimbursement and then also prescribing uh, via telehealth and not, you know, requiring that, um, that on-site visit periodically, et cetera. Uh, any yeah, policy we've, work? Yeah, we've done some policy work. That's And policy work is really critical. I mean, that drives how you practice. Uh, we are probably a little bit more hesitant on that end, but we have hired uh, a policy team to help us and advise us, but that is an area that we want to con continue. We even did a survey during COVID with a, a tr part of our coalition to reach out to those provi providers of buprenorphine to ask them, what has been your experience with the changes, the temporary changes to allow um, telemedicine for your prescribing, you know, looking at other opportunities to expand access to care. So we did a survey all that to help, you know, uh, get a sense of what people were really experiencing and what they felt and, and how, how useful it was. So we're very committed to getting access to care, but we want to also make sure it, you know, it's evidence-based and it's appropriate, but sometimes that's going to mean using clinical judgment and moving forward in situations like during COVID. Yeah. And uh, another thing that you help with that the association helps with is grant related funding for organizations. Like you said, you partner with several different uh, organizations. Um, why is it that a, uh, a, an organization should partner with AAAP and what is that grant work funding yep. work uh, that you all do? So it's not really a grant that we give to people as sub awards. We reach out to organizations let's say in the provider's clinical support system and the key players in, in healthcare. Um, and so we wanted to partner with them because that's where the, their um, constituents, their, that's their target audience, the American Medical Association, the American Dental, um, Pediatrics, Family Medicine, they go to them. They're not gonna come to an addiction psychiatry. Let's, let's just, it's not, they, they don't come to me. They wouldn't even know that we existed. And so they go to their primary um, membership. Um, and so they are the carrier of the information and the material. So that's from a communications perspective, that makes the most sense that we help support them furthering their mission to address the same issues that we have. So, and then we learn from each other. I think the interdisciplinary interprofessional is really key because that's how medicine works. We work as teams, not siloed, we shouldn't. So the more we can do to support that, the better. Our second grant is called the Opioid Response Network. And that's much broader. So it's not just the clinicians, it's anyone, anybody in prevention, treatment, or recovery of opioids and stimulant use disorder can get, get help in training and education. So an individual that's not necessarily gonna, a clinician could do it, but a, a healthcare organization, a parent teacher association, the justice system, a city, um, you as an employer could have somebody come in and do a training for you at no cost. And we have trainers in every state and territory in the country. So that's another mechanism funded by SAMHSA to provide training and education on evidence-based practices. At wow, no that, that's fantastic. Um, and what, you know, how is it that clinicians and organizations can support American Academy of Addiction uh, Psychiatry? So how, how can clinicians and organizations support AAAP? The best thing you can do is go to the website on pcssnow.org or the opioid response network.org and get educated, uh, learn more, um, and then hopefully practice it, go out, you know, um, get involved, learn about, you know, prescribing medications for opioid use disorder. That's really the, the gold standard. Uh, learn about how to make it more general practice integrated into your primary care setting. Um, if you have questions, there's lots and lots of resources. Share the resources with others. There's no need to recreate the wheel. We have the leading people in the country and the organizations and the expertise that have been doing this for many years, but get the word out let others know about it and share um, these resources. That's the best thing because we, our goal ultimately is to provide, to prevent. And then um, if there are people that have um, a substance use disorder uh, and co-occurring psychiatric disorder, we really wanna get them the treatment that they deserve. Excellent. And Catherine, why did you get involved with AAAP? What was, what was your motivation, your drive, your passion? Where does that come from? 
Yeah, interesting, because a lot of years ago, many years, I've been in the field for a long time, but years ago, more times than not, most people were involved because of a personal um, um impacted by personally, either their own sobriety or a family member. I am i don't have that. My family doesn't drink, hasn't drink. We're from the South. It's just something you don't do. So it, uh, I got into it because I was really interested in job motivation, job satisfaction. So I worked at an employee assistance program many, many years ago to train supervisors how not to get personally involved, but to identify people at risk for a substance use problem. And then I went from there to actually being the administrator of a residential treatment center for kids with substance use problem. And that to me is the gold of all, all jobs is working with adolescents. Um, so often they are uh, you know, misunderstood, just like the substance use field is very misunderstood in a lot of labels and a lot of um, stigma. So I think uh, advocating for those have, that have a hard time speaking up for themselves I think that really is my passion is really to help those. So that's kind of my, my, my dig in it. So. Well, in terms of that satisfaction, you're definitely making a difference. Uh, so yeah, going to bed at night, the end of the week, like knowing you made a difference. Um, you were definitely doing that. So for, for you listening to this, uh, please get involved, uh, check out the training that they have available. Uh, there is membership also available. So get involved, realizing that this is a significant need of your patients. Uh, and the more educated you can get, the more empowered you are to help them in a holistic way. So Catherine, so thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Take care and be well.